Hey everyone, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel where we try to bring modern medicine to strength and conditioning and strength and conditioning to modern medicine. I'm Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. This is episode number 57. This is the screening podcast and we're about to jump right into it with myself and Dr. Baraki. But first, a disclaimer. This podcast and all of our work really is for infotainment. We recommend that any questions you have, you should follow up with your doctor. And if we happen to be one of your doctors, well, we're happy to talk about it. So without any further ado, let's hop into this podcast. Welcome back to the Barbell Medicine Podcast. I'm here with the second most handsome doctor in North America, Austin Baraki. What's going on, man? <laughs> Doing all right, man. Still stuck in second place, I suppose. <laughs> well, I'm still alive, so. <laughs> uh, so today is the screening podcast and you've been working hard on this outline. I was just lamenting the fact that so we normally write outlines for our podcasts and we, you know, put resources in there and kind of go back and forth and whatever. But normally, even like the most detailed one we've had to date, I think has been like four pages or three pages, something like that, just because, you know, we're, we're doing bullet points and, and whatnot. This is seven pages and I didn't even add mine because I have another five pages in front of me <laughs> on what, I, you know, the stuff that I, I kind of wanted to talk about. So, <sighs> Okay, to the reader or the listeners at home, this podcast episode kind of encapsulates our thoughts on screening and not only the definitions of which we're going to start out with, uh, but also like practical examples of stuff that we get asked all the time. So let's get into this. Austin, do you want to define for our listeners at home, like what is the purpose of a screening test anyway? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think that uh, just to add a caveat there. We're going to talk about screening in general, which we'll define, but also this applies on a broader scale to testing in general. And so this is important for people to understand if they're going to, you know, ask about getting tests or pursue testing for certain things. This is stuff we get asked about all the time. And it, this podcast should ideally explain or help you understand the thought process that has to go on kind of behind the scenes when we're making decisions about ordering tests or whether or not to order them and what we do with the information we get. So, you know, when it comes to screening as a specific subtype of testing um, or of, you know, clinical evaluation. Uh, it's it's a process of identifying, you know, apparently healthy people, usually people who, have, who don't have particular symptoms, but those who may be at increased risk of a particular disease or a particular medical condition. And the idea is that by identifying these people, you know, in an early stage and an asymptomatic stage or before they have developed that disease or condition, you can then give them more information. You may be able to do subsequent further testing or, or certain treatments to reduce their risk of developing that disease or condition or like alter their their trajectory, you know, in, in uh, you know, tor of progression towards that disease or uh, condition or any complications of it. Yeah, it's basically catching a, a problem before it go it declares itself because you don't need a screening test for somebody who comes in with any like florid or clear you know symptoms of a disease or or medical process that we like are, already have identified. You know, yeah. you know, <laughs> I don't need to screen somebody for malnutrition, for instance. And they come in and you know their BMI is sixteen and they <laughs> right. you know have and their hair is falling out and, and and nails are brittle and everything else. Like I already know what's going on. I don't. I need to move on. Uh, to the next step, which would be like an assessment or uh, figuring out uh, why they have that or something like that. Exactly. So when we talk about screening, we kind of, you know, people tend to ask questions about, well, this particular screening test for me, but really mo the majority of the screening tools that we have that are actually have any sort of good evidence, validity or reliability to them are on the mass level, like population levels. But y you would agree that there's different kind of two different categories you you kind of put put screening tests into yeah sort of I, th like a I think there's there's probably a handful of handful of things that we can say we should be doing across the whole population for pretty much everybody regardless of who they are how old they are their demographic factors I think those are probably relatively few um, those are that's historically how we used to about think about screening is like oh if it's good just do it for everybody and then that'll you know get way better outcomes I think those are getting whittled down more and more over time as we figure out how to better do this process that we call risk stratification meaning we look at particular factors specific to the individual their demographic their age their you know various health conditions or 
or family history or something like that to where we can try to early on try to figure out what risk cohort they may be in and then we can apply our screening tests uh, maybe a little bit in a little bit more directed fashion um, this has been termed you know case finding or targeted case finding um, where you know you you have this suspicion of increased risk in an individual and then you can screen them to either you know uh, uh, pr proceed further, or you can reassure yourself and the patient that there's that they're probably not at you know significantly increased risk and, and needing further evaluation or treatment. I think the further on we go through time, the more uh, these tests and tools are going to evolve from being applied on a mass population level to everybody to a, a bit more selected case finding. And we'll talk about why a little bit later, uh, why this is happening. But again, to emphasize what you were mentioning is that this process of screening and testing on a broad scale, whether it's a targeted case finding or on a mass population level, is very different than the traditional medical model of somebody shows up with symptoms and you pursue diagnostic tests to you know evaluate and figure out what's causing those specific symptoms. These are for people who are apparently healthy and usually don't have specific symptoms. Right. Right. Uh, so if, if we wanted to give uh, our listeners an example of like a mass screening kind of uh, uh, thing, it would be, for instance, like every time you go to your doctor's, the doctor's office, you're supposed to get your blood pressure yeah. sort of measured. Yes. Yeah. Something that everybody, it's applied to everybody, whereas more specific ones that still get applied to a large group of people, but, you know, a more a selective group of folks would be like a colonoscopy, for exactly. instance. You know, once you hit certain age or uh, you certain family history, like that's it, it changes. Um, and I, I agree that you know, going forward, we're going to get better at sort of selecting or or narrowing the groups that get different assessments based on the evidence and and you know the positive predictive value that a test can have for for an individual. So you're just playing; it's an and it's going to end up being a numbers game. But we'll talk about yeah all that. Yeah. Uh, do you want to give people a history of like, like where, how do we even start? How do we get screening here? people? Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, <laughs> like who had this bright, somebody, somebody come up with that idea. Like, Hey, you know what we'll do? It's like big, big laboratory it was like, you know what we'll do? We'll, in, we'll invent a bunch of, bunch of tests of dubious value. And, uh, we'll, we'll say that there's clinical benefits. So doctors have to use them and we'll all get paid. Is well, that, that's, that a, that's, a, that's an interesting argument since I would argue that there are people doing that very thing nowadays, but looking back through history, um, you know, that's not exactly where this whole idea came from. And, and, you know, a lot of this history is not something that I was super familiar with before we started preparing for this podcast. Um, you know, we talk and get taught a lot about screening and medical training, but you know, we don't necessarily learn about where it came from. And it's actually a much more recent, uh, excuse me, a much more recent phenomenon than I actually thought. There's this excellent paper from 2012 by a guy named Armstrong. Uh, it's titled Screening, Mapping Medicine's Temporal Spaces. And he goes through this history in great detail. It's very interesting. And to summarize, it's basically a, a primarily a 20th century phenomenon. And in the late, you know, late uh, uh, 1800s and into the early 1900s, you know, there was tuberculosis was a huge problem. We developed te X-ray technology around that period of time. And then shortly thereafter, you know, you know, we noticed that, you know, we could detect evidence of tuberculosis, although usually in more advanced stages on chest x-ray. But we also noticed that, hey, in latent tuberculosis infections, where it's not an active infection, that we can uh, can see it oftentimes on there uh, and we can, uh, you know, treat patients accordingly. So um, that is a situation where, you know, screening initially began with chest x-rays for latent tuberculosis infection. Later on, as we approached World War II, screening programs ramped up in particular for syphilis, which was everywhere at the time, as well as for psychiatric illness, particularly among military recruits to assess their kind of like mental health and fitness for, you know, entering the military and participating in, in war. Um, it's like a PHQ-2 that they were just doling I, out. Like. I don't know exactly what they use, but something along those lines to figure out if people were crazy or not, or if they were fit for <laughs> fit for duty. And this is something that was interesting that I found is that, uh, you know, for a substantial portion of time around this period, there was actually required premarital syphilis screening, uh, which has some interesting implications, not just because you're, you're like mandating this, but also because the screening test that they were using 
was called a, a cardiolipin based test, which unfortunately oh, yeah. is not very good and has a whole lot of false positives, which probably got some people into trouble in their premarital kind of arrangements at the time. Cause this is just what was pr- going on. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I promise I didn't do anything. Yeah, right. Well, this test <laughs> yeah. is, uh, yeah, it says yeah. differently. Yeah. So, uh, so screening got way bigger, way more prevalent in the post-war years and the Framingham study in 1948 that you hear probably talked about in the cardiovascular world, uh, um, that was actually the place where the whole concept of a risk factor for disease was like created. Uh, it was like invented then, which is not something I knew. I thought it was like, you know, much older that we recognize that there's these things called risk oh. factors, but that's really where it emerged from at the time. And so then, you know, rather than screening for diseases themselves, we actually started screening people for risk factors and treating those. So it was kind of a shift in the, in the paradigm versus screening for actual disease, looking for risk factors, which is a lot of what we do now. So we started screening everything we could think of. But then in the 1980s, people noticed this phenomenon that we now recognize as white coat hypertension, where you measure somebody's blood pressure in the office and, you know, the name suggests that you're in the presence of a doctor in a white coat and it induces some level of anxiety or, you know, something like that that raises your blood pressure and makes the screening test less accurate, less useful. And so we started to wonder, like, are there psychological consequences to this? Are there problems with screening? How accurate is the information we're getting? And so that's when we started to look at how useful the tests are. And we started to ask questions about the harms of screening. Turns out that they're like the, the idea of a harm, harmful effect of screening. Like it's not mentioned anywhere in the scientific literature until like the 1990s, pretty much, which is like, oh, really? No, very surprising to me was that was yeah. where it first showed up. They actually show graphs of, you know, where these terms started to pop into, you know, common use. And so we didn't even think that we could potentially harm somebody by testing until then. And unfortunately, lots of people like in the lay public still think that by and large screening is this fantastic thing, doesn't do any harm. You know, what's the harm in testing? Knowing more information is always better than less. And we'll definitely get to some of the problems with that in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, so let's talk about let's talk about some of the uh, I guess ca- uh, characteristics of a good screening tool. Uh, and so this is kind of like the stats section of this. So uh, first, you know, the first uh, uh, thing that you have down is prevalence, which is basically telling you telling us the number of people in a population who have the specific condition. Whereas incidence is like that same statistic, but over a set period of time. Like how many people get it per year, diagnosis per year, per year yeah, for exactly. instance. Yeah. Uh, and then you have sensitivity and specificity. And and ideally, you'd want a test that has 100 percent for both. But a sensitivity in and of itself is telling uh, it, it is basically saying how many people uh, do ha- uh, do have the condition. So if you had a, something with 100 percent set as 100 percent sensitive, it it's would gonna, have it's no catch, false negatives. It's going to it's going to catch everybody who has the condition. Exactly. And, right. these- and, and not and not miss anybody. So like uh, the, the the example I always use is with BMI. It's like the sensitivity for BMI is like just under 50 percent, meaning. So if you use a BMI cutoff of 30 for obesity, um, it's just the sensitivity is just under 50 percent, which means it misses a significant proportion of the population who actually is carrying too much body fat, but who does not actually have a BMI of greater than 30. Yeah. So, uh, and then the next uh, characteristic of a good screening test would be that it has high specificity. Uh, so this is uh, the ability of the test to discern who in fact does not have the condition. And so if you had 100% specificity, you have no false positives. And the BMI example, for instance, a BMI cutoff of 30 has a really high specificity. It's like 96 or 97%, meaning that if you have a BMI of greater than 30, it is very, very likely that you, in fact, are carrying too much body fat. Um, whereas if it had a lower specificity, then the, that cutoff would not be able to tell you like, oh, wow, well, you yeah. actually are carrying too much body fat. These are important concepts to understand. And they're difficult a lot of times, even among medical students, to get them to sink in. And so, you know, to just to just to reinforce that sensitivity is the ability of a test to catch people who do have a condition. And specificity is the ability of a test to not catch people who do not have the condition. And when we establish these sorts of cutoffs with our tests, like you were saying with BMI or another one that we use all the time in practice is, you know, blood sugar cutoffs and for diagnosing things like diabetes or prediabetes, these are, you know, 
man-made cutoffs that we decided and agreed upon based on some of the statistical data, but you know, they're still, they're, they're not perfect. And we sometimes move them around and that alters, you know, who we're diagnosing and who we're not, di who we're not diagnosing. You've, you've talked about this recently at our seminar lectures when they moved around the cutoffs for, you know, diagnosing high blood pressure, you know, a couple of years ago, if we were to move around the cutoff, for example, and say, Oh, if you know, you know, if you have a blood sugar, uh, you know, that's over 126, you know, you have diabetes. If we move that to say, oh, you know, now you can have a blood sugar up to 150 and then we don't diagnose you until then. You've just changed the way that test kind of functions, the way it operates in practice. So these are man-made things. And people, I think, have kind of like this, this unrealistic belief that tests are like perfect and they're really yeah. not perfect. There's no perfect test. They, they pretty much all either, you know, have imperfect sensitivity or imperfect specificity or both. And they generate false positives or false negatives. And, you know, the, the, the clinician, the person who's dealing with the test has to interpret that, you know, interpret the results with that understanding. And the patients sometimes have to deal with the consequences of those things. If they were the patient who got a false positive test, or if they were the patient who had a false negative test, there are consequences consequences either way, uh, which we'll get yeah. to in a little bit. Yeah. Just, uh, and again, because this is so important to discussing like when you should screen and what screens are useful and what screens aren't it, it by manipulating the numbers of the screening, like whatever the screening parameter is that you, yeah, they're man-made, they're arbitrary, but based on, you know, either existing evidence and where there's not evidence expert opinion, but by manipulating them, you can change want, you know, sensitivity and specificity or either one or both at the same time. Like the BMI example, if I moved the BMI cutoff down to 25, my sensitivity would increase, meaning I would be catching more people that are carrying too much body fat. But my specificity would then drop because then I would be identifying a lot of people who aren't really carrying too much body fat. Uh, it's like a bunch of false positives. So you, you again, you would want, ideally you'd want to test that's both very sensitive and very specific. And these are measures of the validity of a test, right? You know, like if something has low sensitivity and low spe uh, specificity, it is not a valid test in most cases, unless we have nothing better. And then we're kind of like, all right, well, we need to use this screening tool with, a, you know, usually additional data to kind of make a clinical judgment. Yeah, but validity, it, you know, validity just refers to the, the idea that a test is measuring what it's supposed to measure. Um, and so you want to obviously be testing what you think you're testing. And then reliability is the other super important thing where it's consistent, you know, over time. Any test that is not reliable, meaning you get wildly different, inconsistent results from test to test, by definition, can't be valid. So, you yeah. know, when we screen What's for things, we want tests to be sensitive. We want them to catch everybody who has the condition. Even if it comes with a little few false positives, we're okay with that, but we don't want to miss people ideally in a screening program we want the test right. to measure what we think it's measuring and we want it to be consistent and reliable and perform well you know over time across a, a big population yeah what's the reliability constant is it the cohen's kappa or something kappa uh the Kappa score is one statistical measure of, of inter-rater reliability inter there, that yeah. when, when, when you have like different uh, examiners or different people looking at the same phenomenon. If they agree, then that's a statistic they yeah. can use. There are definitely other metrics of reliability for sure, though. Yeah, I was just I don't know why that just the it was like a Greek, a Greek symbol just shot across my. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. OK, so, uh, yeah, I, I I see that you have the Wilson and Younger criteria for like how do we decide what uh, to screen for? This is super interesting stuff. And, and it was actually in, I think you put it in your one of your papers, the smoke screen. Uh, yeah, one of our old articles that we wrote for the, the, other, guy, the, the other guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, on so, our website. We'll, we'll link it in the description. So, so these guys, Wilson and Younger, they came up with these criteria in, in the 1960s. And they were kind of, you know, again, this was the period of time where we were trying to sort out like, you know, how, sh how do we decide? Do we just screen for everything? possible condition under the sun? How do we decide what's worth or not worth testing for? And this is something that, you know, even today, many, many decades later, people still, you know, oftentimes don't really think about because again, they think more information is always better than less. Why not just test for all this stuff? Um, but it's you like know, a there, blue pill, red pill thing. Yeah, exactly. But their, their arguments were, you know, to, I, to summarize them, they said that, okay, 
if we're going to decide we're going to screen for something, it should be, you know, an important health problem in the world and it should have sufficient prevalence in the population. Remember, prevalence is how many people have the condition. So, you know, the ridiculous extreme example that I used in my old article, I think, was like progeria, which is like this, you know, one in multiple millions of people that have this diagnosis. It's probably not worthwhile to screen for this if it's like exceedingly ridiculously rare on a population level. We should not be searching for this in everybody. That would be a re- massive waste of resources, for example. Yeah. Don't don't uh, don't screen for Kreutzfeldt Jakob yes. disease. Yes. <laughs> You're also just induce massive panic with that too. So yes, exactly. Um, so in addition, you know, if if it's a condition that has sufficient prevalence, if enough people have this that make it worth looking for, there should be a latent stage of the disease. This means like some stage leading up to, you know, outright disease where you can actually catch the thing versus if it's like this sudden onset thing where you go from being perfectly healthy to like, you know, dying of the disease in, you know, a matter of, you know, a day or a few days or something like that, then instituting a screening program is unlikely to be beneficial um, because you're not only unlikely to catch people in general, but even if you did, it's like, it sounds like it's a very rapid progressive condition. So there should be some sort of latent stage. Um, With respect to how you test for it, that again, we should be selecting a test as we've mentioned here that is highly sensitive, meaning it is good at catching people who have the condition. Even if it comes with false positives, we want to catch everybody who has it. It should be valid and reliable. So it should test what we think it's testing. It should be consistent and uh, it should be able to catch uh, this condition or a risk factor for this condition during this latent stage before full blown disease has has developed and is causing, you know, havoc uh, in the individual. Um, Ideally, this test is something that people are willing to undergo and accept, which has, you know, a little bit more squishiness there, you know, because that's things like how expensive is it? How much time does it take? Is it super invasive or not? And that obviously is decided on a, you know, test to test basis. So if it's a screening test that costs everyone in the world a million dollars per person to do, not going to be acceptable to the population. If it's a screening test that's going to involve like open laparotomy, cut you open to start looking for this, people aren't going to do that. But of course, there's some, you know. <laughs> some, there's some kind of gray area in between because Obviously, people submit to things like colonoscopies, which is in a way rather invasive. Um, so there's some there's some, you know, some room for, for argument there, just depending on what you're looking for. Um, and ultimately, if you do go, if you check all these boxes uh, and you undergo the screening test and detect something, ideally, there should be a cost effective treatment you could administer during that latent phase or some some uh, some uh, intervention you could perform during that latent phase that if you apply it, then uh, reduces the risk of long term harm, you know, or, or averts death or something like that. All in all, you're wanting the benefits of this screening thing to outweigh the costs and the risks and the harms, which is uh, the, the ultimate kind of bottom line to this. Right. So for the, you wouldn't want to test for something that you ultimately couldn't do anything about, doesn't change yes. you know, or improve somebody's life by any measurable metric uh, that's or that is so rare that you couldn't, you know, yeah, exactly. it's not a big deal anyway, or has no latent period where you're like, well, well. <laughs> yeah, you already is, have the thing. Yeah, this is something that people ask us about. Should I test for this in this condition? And if it's something that we don't have any treatment for, then what's the point? Because, you know, people at first, again, are like, more information is better. I just want to know. And I'm like, well, do you? Do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not not always, especially like, like for instance, with the uh, with Huntington's disease, right? Yeah. So like if you didn't know that you had it already and then you, you know, well, I'm going to screen myself for Huntington's, which there's, you know, the treatments for limited or, very. Uh, but yeah, the, there's a huge, there's a very high suicide rate of people like f- after, after they find out that they have this thing, right? Because yeah. it's like, there's a, you know where you know, your life's headed. And it's not, I'm not trying to be, you know, uh, 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 dismissive of this thing, but it's like, I, I wouldn't, I would not routinely recommend screening for that because of there's a significant harm that's associated yeah. with this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the article that I cited earlier on the history of screening in that issue of that journal that it went a lot into the sociology of screening, which I also found very interesting. And they did some qualitative studies where they were kind of interviewing patients and getting their experience and their thoughts um, on the, on, you know, their test results and things like that. And there were, you know, people who were saying like, once I found this out, I felt like, you know, I was a ticking time bomb and they have all these sorts of thoughts that go through their head in response to screening. And if it's something that there's nothing you can do for that condition, then I would argue that going through that process was more harmful than beneficial for the individual. Screening lumbar x-ray? Thoughts? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I just want to know if I'm degenerating, Doc. <laughs> yeah, well, you are. You're a bipedal organism. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. So, okay, let's talk about some of the problems that arise with 
tests, like these ones that we really have to consider. Like if we know that they that they these things happen with a particular screening test over and over again, we, it might prevent us from like routinely using them or sure. prevent organizations from routinely recommending them. Um, you want to talk about type one and type two error? Yeah. So so um, rather than using some of the more esoteric statistical terminology, we can just talk about the concept of a false positive and a false negative. And so, you know, in a screening test, which, again, ideally is very sensitive, catches everybody that has it, um, you know, that there's always go there's likely going to be some false positives that come along with that. Some people who get caught by the test, for example, who don't actually have the condition. And so this is what um, has led to kind of the, the screening and confirmation sequence that we use. So you might screen for a test with a particular, you know, with a screening test that's again very sensitive, but if you get positive results, then because of the risk of false positive, you proceed to step two and you perform some type of confirmatory testing um, to see does it, which that confirmatory test is very, very specific, meaning it's very good at not catching people who don't have the test. Um, and so when you apply that as a second step, then all the people who are false positives, ideally, they don't get caught by that test and you can give them reassurance and say, good, you're fine. You don't need to worry about this. And then people who are positive, you can say very confidently you have this and we can proceed to what we need to do about it. Conversely, one, of, oh yeah, go ahead. Well, so one example of this is, and again, I just like this because people are very familiar with these two simple tests, one being BMI and one being waist circumference. It's almost like BMI, you can just, somebody's height and weight, you can calculate, you know, that's very, uh, that's like a screen that you can use. And then you need to do a waist circumference on top of that to almost confirm whether or not or further refine your initial sort of uh, the screening tool. Um, there's a count, literally countless examples within the medical, you know, uh, sort of lexicon that we have like all these different test orders. But as far as like super common ones, yes. Yeah. Again, we, we screen with something that, yeah, even if it gives us some false positives, we're cool with it as long as it identifies, you know, everyone Everybody with the thing. It. Yeah. And then, and then refine after that with a confirmation test. Yeah. Yeah. Versus on the other hand, a false negative is, you know, what you don't want to happen with a screening test, meaning that somebody who is in the population um, who have the condition that your, te your screening test fails to catch them. That was a pretty big failure for a screening test. And what happens as a result is that individual gets false reassurance out of their test. They're like, oh, sweet, I'm, I'm good to go. And meanwhile, something could be brewing or they may actually have this condition that will then ultimately manifest itself later on um, in certain Certain situations. And so that's another problem that you prefer to avoid, which is why we opt for very, very sensitive tests and we're more okay with false positives in a setting of screening when we feel it's appropriate than, than we do feel with uh, uh, okay with false negatives. Well, we're going to take a break and we'll be back with more screening information right after this. With the whey protein, people kept asking us, which protein should I take? What do you recommend? And when we looked into it, we didn't really feel comfortable recommending any protein. So we just made our own. It's only got four ingredients. The essential amino acid and BCA contents are very high. This is exactly what you want out of a whey protein. All right, we are back here on the Barbell Medicine Screening Podcast. We are talking about uh, false positives and false negatives. And now I think it's a good time to talk about, like, what is the general public perception of screening tests? You know, my impression is that the public's like, hey, I definitely want to know all this information. Yeah. Screen me for everything. Yeah. I want the full, the pan scan. <laughs> please, <laughs> yes. please tell me. Yes, yes, that is correct. Research, uh, we have research showing this, that uh, general enthusiasm for screening is very high. Pe majority of people in general, you know, endorse the idea that screening for healthy individuals is almost always a good idea. Um, and this is something we see in our routine practices of people coming to us with like, you know, 10 page reports that they got when they had either some clinician um, who did this or they themselves went out and purchased, you know, a bunch of testing for everything. They just clicked all the boxes, give me all the information. Um, and then they come to us with the with the information and ask us to interpret it for them. And we have to look at it and, you know, uh, interpret it uh, very carefully because, again, of how often they're coming to us with false positive kind of results on these tests or things that, you know, probably ideally shouldn't have been detected. Um, there's research, for example, that's showing that 
about only 20, 20 to 21 percent of people in one particular study I found actually understood that screening tests are intended for asymptomatic people or people who are generally healthy and don't have symptoms. They found that that was related to their level of education on the topic. And, and this carries forward in general, uh, you know, once screened or, or, you know, around the topic of screening in general, people wildly overestimate how benef the benefits of screening. They think it's way more beneficial than it actually is for many conditions. And I'll give some examples a little bit later. And they're completely, they tend to be completely unaware of the possibility that screening can actually have harms uh, to it as a result. One example of, of uh, you know, of this in general is the concept of, of over-diagnosing conditions, which is not the same as a false positive, uh, but it's something that comes up in a lot of discussions of screening. It's like medicalizing somebody's like there's their day to day, their normal normal experiences, and now all of a sudden they get a diagnosis for that thing, and it's like, uh, do I did I did I benefit from this diagnosis? Like, should I have? Yeah, that's should. one over over medicalizing normal life things is one good example of of over diagnosis. It's something people have probably you know heard about or in in uh, in lay conversation out there. I think that's something that some people are aware of. Um, another one is I, if if by screening you're identifying problems that were never going to cause harm anyway, um, whether that means that's because they're actually benign, or whether that means they don't progress at all, or whether that means they progress too slowly to cause any problems or if they actually end up just resolving getting better on their own and you would have been just as good if you had never found it arguably better because you wouldn't have had the you know the anxiety and the worry about this condition that was never going to cause you a problem that's an example of over detection it's like a it's like an incidental you know it's like that's, when you do the like if you do a ct scan on yeah. somebody you're like hmm, I wonder what that thing is yeah but I it's find, just I mean, I'm, I'm stuck unfortunately finding that stuff every day in practice if i'm you know looking to diagnose one thing but because a radiologist has to look at the whole scan and tell us what he sees he might see stuff in other places and i'm like i didn't want to know that man <laughs> but i have to deal yeah, with yeah, it yeah <laughs> and now we have to follow yeah yeah so it, I guess I guess the the really interesting sort of intersection here is is you have this public lack of education just as a general rule when it comes to like medic medicine how it works what is the purpose of a screening test how does it differ from an assessment and like and then who is the correct population for a screening test because I, I think the way some people view medicine is like okay if I have the resources if I have the resources I could I could have better health if I just you know, pay a little bit more money and get this additional screen and get this additional information. I mean, what are the, you know, Dr. B, what's, what's the big deal? You know, like what, what would you say to dissuade somebody from checking every single box on their quest diagnostic, like blood test, you know, that I want to be, I want to screen for all these antibodies, you know, for instance, to identify some autoimmune disease or, or whatever. What, what would you say to that? Yeah. And, and unfortunately, this is, like you said, a problem in the more advanced or developed kind of healthcare world where we have access to, you know, high resolution imaging, CTs, MRIs, things like that. But even a plain x-ray can give you a false positive diagnosis where there's direct to consumer testing available. People can go to, you know, whatever lab website they want and buy their own stuff, go get it drawn. And I think that, you know, this this idea that a screening test can be harmful is very, very under recognized um, and very underappreciated in that not only are there psychological consequences, massive nocebo effects that we've talked about at length before, if you get certain negative results, but also, you know, let's say that you get a result that uh, is concerning enough that once you have that result, you need to act upon it. You need to, you know, go further with uh, further evaluation. Um, sometimes that involves invasive procedures. Sometimes those invasive procedures have their own risks and complications. Um, for example, there was a good um, kind of case example um, that was uh, uh, written and published in, I think it was in JAMA by Vinay Prasad, who's a big, he's an oncologist who's big in this kind of uh, world, just discussing screening and testing and things like that. And the case example he gave was, it was an, it was a gentleman who was in his, uh, who was in his sixties and he had had a history of smoking. And so the standard practice for somebody in that situation is they get screened for abdominal aortic aneurysms and he got screened and they found one. And of course, based on, 
you know, now that you found it, you, he, he ended up qualifying to have it intervened upon. So they did the surgical procedure. And in the subsequent, you know, the, the aftermath of the surgical procedure, he suffered multiple complications uh, related to this and the blood thinners that he had to be on and ultimately ended up needing to get one of his low, his legs amputated as a result. And when they were discussing this case, they talked about, you know, some of the statistics on screening for this particular thing and how many people you actually have to, you know, screen and treat for this condition before you actually manage to prevent a catastrophic event. And those were numbers and data and statistics that had not been discussed with the patient. And his thought on it was, if I had known that, you know, if you if you screen a thousand people that only, a, you know, a couple or a handful or something actually end up benefiting from it, I probably wouldn't have undergone this in the first place. And, and he may have lived the rest of his life without ever knowing whatever without ever having any issues. And these are things that we see in terms of the complications and consequences to screening, whether appropriate screening or inappropriate screening. We see it on both ends over time when people when people test, there's overdiagnosis and there's overtreatment, which is its own separate phenomenon that happens a lot. Um, and, and people, you know, in general, they're unaware of this concept of overdiagnosis. They initially find the concept confusing. That's what some of the research literature on the matter, you know, would suggest. Once they understand it, they kind of see that, yeah, it's probably important to take into account if we're going to decide to screen or test for a condition or not. Um, but it, it turns out that even once they understand it, people say they would still want to know if they had a cancer, even if it was never going to cause them any problem or cause any harm in their lifetime. Didn't It wouldn't change their decision about screening. Um, and, and even when people have actually suffered a false positive result, they remain very positive about the, the idea of screening, and which is very interesting because it's different from our perspective on the matter of, you know, first kind of do no harm kind of approach. They're like, what, don't care about the harm as long as I know whether it was important or not or whether it was going to cause any problem or not doesn't really concern me. Well, people generally have positive outlooks, like more favorable outlooks for themselves compared to other people. You know, they're like, oh, well, yeah, some other people might be harmed, but. But not me. But not me, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or like some other people might be tricked by this uh, this thing. But not, but not me. I mean, and it it, it sounds like also that it, it there's maybe a lack of education and understanding on 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 both levels, both in the public, but then also in the medical field. You know, because it's like it, it, if doctor like if doctors knew the like number needed to treat, like number needed to screen to identify one positive, you know, uh, to save abdominal life, aortic aneurysm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. To save it. Yeah. And, and so, so that might change how strongly they recommend yeah. or argue for or push because then they're like, you know, if they start weighing it, they're like, well, you know, one in a thousand is much different than one in 10, yeah. for instance. Yeah, exactly. And I think part of it, there's like legal things and, you know, requirements and uh, meeting meeting certain, you know, demands of, you know, we have to check your boxes for the insurance company or quality metrics and things like that. Whereas, you know, it really arguably should be more of a shared decision making kind of thing with the patient talking to them about how, you know, how good this is, the, you know, the chances that they stand to benefit versus uh, versus get harm. And there's there's actually some good tools for this that we'll talk about uh, towards the end about how to, act, you know, uh, to do this in practice. Yeah. So the big thing with screening is kind of like the, the idea again, it, let's say you have a test that meets all the criteria of like a good screening test, right? You're the appropriate candidate. You've got the appropriate, you know, clinical context to get screened. The idea is that this screening test is somehow going to benefit you by reducing either the burden of the disease or mortality from the disease, like yeah. on some level. Yeah. W what's the evidence look like for this? Like, uh, uh, it's something, uh, like cancer yeah. screening. So yeah. It seems like this is like a big deal. You know? Sure. Yeah. And that's one of the big assumptions is that, hey, if we reduce the mortality attributable to this disease, that that automatically translates into an overall mortality benefit. And it's a big assumption and it doesn't always appear to be the case. Um, and, it, you know, part of the issue with this sort of analysis, a lot of the evidence justifying certain screening tests looks at what's called disease specific mortality. Did you die of this particular condition? Um, Dying that, from the cancer in this yeah. case. Yeah, yeah. yeah, which which assumes that we can always very accurately determine the specific cause of death and attribute it correctly, which I would say we can't do necessarily as accurately all the time as we think. So so that's sure. kind of an issue. Um, and so there's this interesting 2002 systematic review of 12 large randomized trials on cancer screening. And uh, of them, seven showed discrepancies or differences between the effect on disease specific mortality and all cause mortality. Five of those 
showed that uh, disease-specific mortality, supposedly dying of that disease, decreased, but they showed that all-cause mortality, meaning your lit lit likelihood of dying in general, did not change or even increase all-cause mortality. Two of the so, so. Two, two of the others two of the seven showed differences in the magnitude of the mortality reduction, meaning that if disease specific mortality went down by you know say fifteen percent, that people in general overall they died less only maybe five percent. The, the magnitude of the effect was different, suggesting that you can't that the that the benefits in in uh, you know reduced risk of death from that condition were not translating over one to one to people's risk of death in general. It's, so it's it's almost like. It's like, all right, cool. Well, we diagnosed your cancer. All right, we treated you for that. But something else is going to get you. Yeah, like in the same time period. Yeah. That, or the, even the diagnose, like the diagnostic process or the therapeutic process, like in and of itself, can harm you to a point where maybe you would have been, you know, better off. Yeah, that's one of the arguments. Is they say that this these discrepancies could be due to you know issues, methodological issues with the studies, or it could be that people are actually dying more after they get you know uh, 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 screened and diagnosed due to negative effects of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Meaning they might may die less frequently of that particular condition, but you put them through the course of treatment and maybe they die of something else. So you put them on you know chemotherapy or something, and then they get overwhelming sepsis and die from an infection or something like you know just some other example yeah. um, that kind of negates the more the mortality benefit from diagnosing the cancer so as a result yeah. well, they've, they've ended up abandoning a bunch of different historical screening programs there are things that we used to screen for you know that we don't screen for anymore because we found that hey like people die at the same rate from you know all cause mortality in general when we do this so maybe it's not worth doing these screening programs like just doing routine chest x-ray screening for for lung cancer in people um, in general is not something we do anymore as an example right so, it, it, you know, I hear the people at home whispering, maybe not whispering. They're like, that's big, big, uh, big medicine. You know, <laughs> they, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> they're, they're just as confused as they were, you know, 100 years ago. Yeah. And, and I guess the way that I interpret stuff like this is, you know, like no field of practice is really more self-critical than medicine in that. We're like constantly reevaluating, retooling, re kind of like collating evidence to be like, what is the best move forward? Because we understand like the not we, just you and I, but like the field as, as a whole, like realizes how important this is. Sure. Right. So it's like so it's like, yep, there are the things that are going to change and change rapidly at times, you know, and, and I think that be, again, being OK with this uncertainty is like the only way to move forward. Sure. And, and I, I just don't want people to have this negative reaction to be like, well, I'm just not going to go to my doctor then because they don't know anything. Yeah. You know, it's like you you can only you can only do benefit by what you know at that given time and, and move forward based on that. Um, I don't think that if you, you didn't have medical training, you could do learn this for yourself. Yeah. You know, I think you still have to rely on a medical professional and just kind of I guess be skeptical of you know very strong claims and be sure. just, uh, and and be a be proactive in your in your own health rather than just throw your hands up and say well you know we don't know anything nothing's beneficial <laughs> Like, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, just like we talk about in other contexts, we let the, we try to let the evidence guide us and we have some good resources that we're going to talk about in a little bit to give people an idea, to give them a place where they can look to get a little bit better understanding of this and even tools for clinicians to use when making decisions about should I be screening or testing for this or not. This is a good time to take another small break. We'll be right back after this. With our seminar, we wanted to look at what are the most common questions people have about training with any sort of medical condition. That's high blood pressure, diabetes, low testosterone, low back pain. We wanted to address all of these things in a systematic way. Barbell Medicine is a company that works with people from all walks of life. We work with athletes. We work with general population. We work with people in the medical field and people who are totally new to all of it. So, biggest takeaway was definitely the uh, the pain management lecture. There's a lot of bad information out there, and I'm glad I did this because I learned more things than I had any idea on. 
we have some people who come to our seminars that have never touched a barbell before. And we teach them how to lift for the very first time on the seminar platform, which is pretty cool too. Uh, we take an approach where we educate people about these conditions from a biological standpoint, from a psychological standpoint, and then also the social determinants that can influence people's health and disease outcomes. Our idea is to make the community a better place through these social change agents. You go through our seminar, you learn a lot, you get to go spread that into your community, and we're trying to make the world a better place. All right, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine Screening Podcast. Dr. Baraki, we're going to get into some specific examples and resources for people to kind of really drive this, this these points home as far as how good some of these screening tests are, what's the evidence on them, what do we recommend, and like where people can find out more. Let's start with... Let's start with like medicine, just sure. normal primary care, internal medicine. Like when a person says, well, how, how often should I have my physical, yeah. you know, and, and like yearly labs, quote unquote. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, and then if you ask, well, what are your yearly labs? And like, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, yeah. labs, just, just, uh, do, just do them. Yeah. <laughs> do the labs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so the annual physical is a big one that, you know, that we, that I deal with kind of all the time. Um, and, and maybe people may, this might be the first time people are realizing or thinking that, you know, the annual physical, so to speak, is actually a screening thing when they don't have any symptoms or that average risk in general, there's like nothing remarkable going on. This is an example of, you know, pretty widespread screening. And it tr dates back well into the 1800s, um, where, you know, it was initially proposed as a way to maintain health to ward off tuberculosis. And in the 1920s, a bunch of medical organizations like the American Medical Association started advocating for an annual physical exam to maintain good health. And that went on for a long time until, you know, again, like later in the 1900s and the 70s, 80s, we started to, you know, uh, get some more, get a little bit more critical about our screening and should we be doing this or not. And since then we have some increasing data that, you know, doing a comprehensive head to toe physical exam, looking at every little, you know, every organ system and doing all these tests and checking reflexes on everybody and all this stuff in routine primary care and pay people who are at average risk with no symptoms uh, probably doesn't really provide much value. And similarly doing comprehensive lab testing, which itself is a big bucket of what potential tests you could throw in there, but people will routinely want to do things like a complete blood count, get a urinalysis, get complete metabolic panel, the stuff that doing this, you know, routine comprehensive testing probably doesn't provide a ton of benefit, you know, at this kind of when, when we take this kind of population perspective on screening and testing. And so, you know, subsequent to that, organizations like the American College of Physicians, the U.S. Pre Preventative Services Task Force, U.S. Public Health Service, they started to say that, hey, Maybe just these comprehensive checkups for people who are healthy and have no problems um, are probably not providing tons of benefit versus taking a more selective approach, you know, looking at things specific, in, you know, a little bit more targeted way, the targeted case finding that I mentioned um, to to detect and prevent health problems. And then but but and how do doctors like respond to that? You know, because sure. the, I, in most times when there's like a change, you know, there's like this, you know, early adopters and then yeah. people who later on down the line. Sure. I mean, it, it seems like if you, you told doctors at that time who were kind of viewed as being this, I mean, there's very, there's a lot of respect and it's yes, a lot of, sure. just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, just, you know, a uh, uh, responsibility and, and, uh, given to them. If you said, Hey, you know, maybe not seeing, seeing you every year, is isn't really, isn't really helping. They're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> it's, Me? That was controversial then, and it's still controversial today. When they've done surveys on this in the general population, uh, well over 60, 60 to 65% of uh, lay people in the public believe an annual physical is necessary and it's beneficial. They frequently request uh, exams and, tech and and tests and procedures that are that don't have proven value while not requesting things that are of proven value. And of course, this influence, this is part of what influences physician practice. When they've done the same surveys among physicians, similar, greater than 65% support the concept of an annual physical. Um, and this belief is thought to be rooted in, you know, a few unproven Proven ideas. One, that this annual comprehensive exam detects illness, you know, um, and another one that it's a proven value. And these are things that have not been definitively proven. There's act there's still active debate on this topic. We had a discussion on it in our in our Facebook group recently about how valuable is it when we look at criteria for, you know, uh, effective screening. Um, 
because everyone has stories. All, all physicians are going to have stories. I myself have stories of, you know, oh, when I was in, you know, it, it, looking at this patient, I caught something that they weren't complaining of. And I'm such a good doctor. Sure. And, and it's, you know, it makes us feel good and it reinforces our biases and our beliefs. It's just hard for us to know for sure that what we caught at that time was, you know, a latent stage of a disease that would have progressed to cause problems or whether we actually overdiagnosed something that would have gotten better on its own or not caused any problems or that could have been detected later without any negative consequences consequences. These are just like assumptions that we have that are difficult to prove. And since they're assumptions we have that are difficult to prove, we prefer to look at like larger scale, more controlled data sets on the matter to say how effective is this practice uh, actually. Um, and so with a lot of this stuff, we don't really have as much data or, you know, evidential support as people think. And doctors, of course, are practicing, you know, it's a social relationship. So patient expectations inform how we practice legal concerns. Of course, we don't want to miss something and get sued for it. There's an aspect of tradition that that's how, how we were all trained in, in medical training. I mean, I remember sure. getting told as a medical student, every single patient you see every single time you have to listen to their heart and their lungs. And I'm like, yeah, I remember thinking about that. I was like, that's weird. Why are those two and not something else? And what about all the stuff we talked about? In, yeah. All this other stuff with, <laughs> you know, screening and stuff like that. Like, what am I finding? Most of the time, if I listen to somebody who has no problems, no symptoms, they're feeling well, they're breathing normally, their oxygen saturation is great. If I hear a little something, you know, what am I going to think about that? I'm going to be like, oh, well, that was probably a false positive on this test, test 100%. versus yeah, assuming yeah. that it's some horrible thing most of the time. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are other arguments for why we should do these sorts of annual physicals. And people have said that, you know, this routine contact can improve patient physician relationships. It gives you a specific time where you can do preventative health care, which I kind of agree with in that you're meeting sure. and you're doing things you're, you should be doing things that are effective. So promote promoting, you know, physical exercise, screening for obesity, you know, um, uh, checking for substance abuse and other high risk behaviors. But of course, if you have a limited amount of time with this patient and you're spending a bunch of it on stuff that is not a proven value. It might take away from how much time you can spend doing things that are useful or are, do have proven value. Yeah. And even in that, you know, sort of th uh, mindset where you're like, okay, well now, even if, if you're going to come see the doctor yearly, yeah, sure. Maybe, you know, all the physical exam components aren't, you know, super well proven as far as their efficacy for preventing or identifying, you know, a burden of disease. Uh, but even the idea that get counseling people on nutrition and exercise, like while we want that to be like, yes, we want that to happen. But, you know, the large data sets suggesting that that done in a screening, you know, in a, in a, in a primary care setting um, being beneficial long term. I mean, we would have a hard time like making a very specific argument towards that without using. You know, we'd have to make some leaps to yeah. get there. Yeah, but not not a, not a lot, yeah, you know. I but not, have, not that's unreasonable. Sure, but it's, I think we have some evidence that we can influence patient behavior. But of course, that's difficult to show, you know, in a large, you know, if you take like just a random sample of primary care doctors because they don't necessarily all have the skills, the knowledge base, the 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 training to do that sort of interviewing and counseling effectively. Because I remember sure. seeing the data when the new physical activity guidelines came out. They said that you know when these sorts of conversations are are, are performed based on existing theories and models of behavior change that we can actually influence patient behavior. Uh, but of course, not everybody practices in that way based off of you know, models of behavior change, like the ones that we talk about at our seminar. Um, so, so this is not to say that you should obviously not see your doctor or not, you know, go through this, this kind of process, but we're just kind of making you think a little bit about what is more or less important at those visits. Cause there are certainly things that are, you know, useful and recommended, like you said earlier, checking, you know, blood pressure at these visits, doing BMI, waist circumference screening at these visits is, is super useful much more useful with more evidential support compared to certain other screening things that we can be doing in practice. Yeah. And so and you can go to that. Yeah. What's the AHRQ uh, website? Yeah. For people who either are clinicians in this setting and saying, what should I be doing or what should I be screening for? Or if you're a patient and you're like, you know, I wonder, I'm curious and want to, you know, take a more active role in this and see what is recommended for me on a more targeted, you know, uh, level with respect to screening this website, the agency for healthcare research quality, HRQ, they have a tool called the electronic preventative services selector tool, EPSS. If but the website, I think they may have an app too. There's an app. You can yeah. go there, you just punch in your age and your demographic and it spits out all the things that would be recommended with 
high level, like grade A evidence, what things have like grade B evidence, what things we don't have great evidence for, or what things we definitely shouldn't do. And we can include a link to that for everybody so they can, they can access it. I, I you know, definitely uh, encourage, especially clinicians to, to look at this so that they can better get, get a better idea for, you know, hey, uh, is what I'm doing consistent with the evidence base or not? Yep. Also, I would recommend, I mean, if people, people start are thinking about this now hard and they're like, oh man, I feel like well, next time I see my doctor, I've got, some, I've got some questions. <laughs> uh, I, I would highly recommend reading the book, How Doctors Think by Jerome Groupman. There's a, he, there's a lot in there on the screening process and also just patient doctor like interactions as far as like how to ask better questions, how to get the information that you actually want, you know, from the interaction. And I think that'd be very useful. Uh, I would not, however, recommend getting that book on audiobook. Uh, I'm a big bad? fan of, <laughs> oh my, oh man, this was like, like a 1940s, like radio announcer, just like, <laughs> and then he said to the patient, you know, <laughs> I, I was like this whole time, like it was like an eight hour drive. I was like, listen to this thing the whole time. And I, I was really, there's a lot of caffeine consumed to stay awake for that. Yeah. So, but that book's a great book. Um, and yes, the EPSS, uh, app is super useful. Also medical residents. If you're ever on rounds and you're about to get pimped on this, you're welcome. <laughs> this, is a, this is a good one. Uh, okay, let's move on to cancer. So, so you know, I remember in in uh, during intern year, I'd have the people would come in for their uh, you know uh, uh, their either initial like they were just joining the practice or um, they're there just for their uh, their yearly physical. They and you ask them, hey, are you there anything you're concerned about? Any you know, somebody recently got diagnosed with cancer in their family or close to them. And they're like, I, I wonder that I might have, you know, breast cancer or something. And and, uh, and you're, you know, if it's not an appropriate time to screen them or if they, you know, based on existing guidelines or uh, then they kind of almost feel like, what if he's missing it? You know, what? But how good is the evidence even on cancer screening? Yeah, like, it's particularly in that case. Yeah, this is a this is an enormous topic. Obviously, we're not going to be able to get through like every example or all the different tests that we could or couldn't do. But I think that couching it in the context of those Wilson criteria that we cited earlier, where you know it's a cancer, if it's a cancer that is prevalent enough to make it worth screening, it's not some super super rare, you know, uh, uh, type of tumor that you know almost never happens. It needs to have a latent stage. If we have a good you know test that we can do. That's acceptable to the population, and if we have a cost-effective treatment that we can do to significantly influence mortality, um, where the benefits ultimately outweigh the risks, that's how we decide what we should or shouldn't screen for. Now, with that said, a lot of people, both clinicians and patients, are not super familiar with how good screening is, and so that's I think something that's very frequently missing from these sorts of discussions. Usually, it's like, oh, you hit a certain age, and the chart pops up a you know, an alert to say, oh, they're this age, you need to be doing the screening now. And so you say you have to do this screening and the patient submits to the screening without much kind of information going back and forth. And so when they've done surveys on this, again, they found that the general public wildly tends to overestimate the benefits of, of screening. Um, so, for example, you know, in one in one uh, in one survey trial, I found that 68 percent of women thought that a mammography would prevent or reduce the risk of bre getting breast cancer. 62 percent of women thought that screening at least halved the risk of breast cancer. And 75% of them thought that 10 years of screening would prevent 10 breast cancer deaths per 1,000 women. Um, and so if we go to the actual evidence on this from, per, for example, a 2013 Cochrane review on uh, mam mammography screening for breast cancer, they say, quote, for every 2,000 women invited for screening throughout 10 years, one will avoid dying of breast cancer and 10 healthy women who would not have been diagnosed if there had not been screening will be treated unnecessarily. Furthermore, more than 200 women will experience important psychological distress, including anxiety and uncertainty for years because of false positive findings. And so I'm not saying this to encourage or discourage anybody from, you know, from from uh, to, to say, you know, suddenly that they're going to quit doing screening or something like that. But this is information that needs to be part of the discussion. Um, similarly, for example, if we look at prostate cancer screening, you know, Cochrane review from 2013, their pool data showed no significant reduction in prostate cancer specific or overall mortality from screening. And of course, this remains to this day a contentious issue among physicians that really depends, it seems to depend 
depend a lot on whether you're a urologist or whether you practice in another or an oncologist or if you practice in another field. And that really a lot of it has to do with the types of patients that you see and how often you see, you know, severe cases or something like that that can sometimes inform your opinions on it. Um, right. 2018. So, so, oh, yeah, go ahead. No. So like if you're a urologist and you see prostate cancer, particularly like the bad kind like over and over. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Then you're like, well, this is clearly happening. Yeah often enough to screen for. And it, well, it's just really hard to, and I'm not saying that every urologist thinks that because there's probably sure. some urologist who happens to be the strongest urologist in the world <laughs> listening to this podcast right yeah. now. He's like, hey, sure. we don't all think like that. And it's yeah. like, yeah. Well, no, sure. It's just if people in general are cognitive biases or sure. Well, they are what they are. And so yeah. that's, that's kind of how that works. Yeah. There's, I mean, this stuff is, yeah, we're definitely not saying that, you know, these doctors are idiots for thinking this way. Cause it's pretty common. You know, there's the same, same thing tends to happen in, among other specialties and among other, you know, types of conditions. Um, uh, um, and so, you know, it, this also gets, you know, the, 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 the flames get fanned every time there's like some big high profile person who gets diagnosed with a cancer or dies from a cancer or something like that. Like a few, what was it? Two years ago or something forget who who was diagnosed with the brca gene mutation and then that there was this talk of everybody yeah. going and getting mastectomies to reduce their risk of colon can uh, of breast cancer so if kim kardashian got diagnosed yeah. with that like <laughs> yeah. dear lord yeah, yeah. like yeah. All right. Yeah. So similar gonna... data, similar data for, for the prostate cancer piece, this uh, BMJ article from 2018 is a, a meta analysis on the topic. And they, their data said that, you know, for screening, there would be one less death from prostate cancer per thousand men screened over 10 years. Um, and they found that uh, biopsy and treatment related complications were limited in that trial, although they've been moderate severity complications uh, noted elsewhere. For example, they said that for every thousand men that were screened, approximately one person would be hospitalized for sepsis. Three would require pads for urinary incontinence after their their their, their screening process and biopsy. Twenty five percent might experience erectile dysfunction. So so there are these consequences that typically go under recognized. And and again, not saying that people you know absolutely should or shouldn't go through this process, but again that these discussions need to be had between patient and physician. Um, so the place, you know, where I would suggest people go to see some of the evidence on this stuff, which is a pretty useful tool, the UCSF, um, uh, website, they have a tool called the e-prognosis cancer screening tool. And, and basically that's a pretty neat way where they, you can put in some demographic information about the patient and, uh, and, and their kind of, uh, how, how good they are in terms of their health status and things like that. And it can give you an idea of how likely are they to benefit from screening or how likely are they to be harmed from screening and how that should inform your ultimate decision to go through with it or not. And so we like that tool. Yeah. Their UCSF is like definitely one of the leaders here. So we'll put that, uh, that link in the description below. All right. Now, now for some stuff that's, uh, I get, it was really hard for me to, to really like focus on this because I, ha I mean, just knowing my biases coming in. Uh, uh, so we're going to talk about some nutrition exercise, um, screening and kind of go from there. And, and my bias coming in was that, in a normal healthy population, no nutrition screening <laughs> would be necessary, right? And so I, I, then I was tasked with the, the, the you know, going through and, and, and trying to find evidence to disprove my initial hypothesis. And so I started reading some very strange things like the prevalence of uh, chromium deficiency in non-diabetic yeah like you just and you're now you realize like how far down the rabbit hole you actually are and you're like somebody save me so all right to begin when we talk about nutrition like again yes we're looking the, the for things that are very prevalent things that you can identify before they cause florid disease or symptoms that you would you know then assess uh and the tests are reliable and valid and then you know we actually have a treatment for and the benefits of all of this stuff outweigh the risks. So uh, the guidelines for nutritional screening, just as a general, you know, the general rule are the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition or ASPEN guidelines. And so just right off, like from the from the beginning, people do not need nutrition screening outside of being uh, when they're hospitalized or in an acute care setting. So like if you're just a normal person, 
you know, ambulating about in the community without <laughs> disease, like without like, you know, chronic disease that otherwise would is associated with nutritional deficiencies. You do not need to be screened for anything that this includes stuff like vitamin D deficiency, like cobalt deficiency, like nu- you know, NMD deficiency, which when I saw this infographic, it was like, oh, you should screen for this, you know, cofactor enzyme deficiency. I'm like, can't you even do that? And so then I went and looked at the, t- so then I went and looked at the test for this. Like the test in and of itself is not sensitive, is not specific. It's not validated, meaning that it's never been assessed clinically because nobody does this test. Uh, and so that's what you're going to find when you, when you, you know, particularly in social media groups, there'll be these weird recommendations like, oh yeah, go get screened for this weird, you know, vitamin or cofactor or you know how to optimize your nutritional status for this one esoteric you know mineral or something like that yeah and then you go so so let's just say you come across that and then you're like hmm i wonder like does this like should i right so then you have to back up go to like these national international health organizations say do they recommend screening for this right like and, and then if you don't then find some organization that is reputable and, and and see, do they recommend screening for this? And and if they don't, like, okay, well, do they ever in the context of any disease, like does any organization ever like recommend screening for this? And if they do, then you find out when. So yeah, it, most of these mm, nutrition optimization screening sort of tests are in the context or like derived from the context of a serious disease. Like if you have, you know, liver failure or kidney failure or uh, other chronic disease related to either of those organs. Yes, you can certainly become, you know, vitamin deficient, nutrient deficient and require, and then you require specific testing periodically to determine what type of intervention needs to be taken from there. But if you don't have those, which you would have symptoms of those things, which would require workup, then you do not need to be screened for these. So the current recommendations are to not screen you know, for any sort of nutritional deficiency, unless somebody uh, uh, is in a hospitalized or acute care setting and then meets criteria to move on to an assessment. Now, here's the most interesting thing about nutrition screening. There's like a dozen different screening tests out there, like a whole bunch of them. And when you actually go look at the evidence for how sensitive and specific and reliable these tests are, only one passes the muster on this with like greater. Yeah. So, so they basically uh, looked for, do they have a sensitivity of greater than 80%? Do they have a specificity of greater than 80%? Are they reliable? Uh, and, and so only one test, the uh, malnutrition screening tool is the only one that has a sensitivity and specificity. Uh, you know, it's very high, relatively high and actually has any data on the reliability because these other tests don't. And, the, and, and I, I want to stress to the listener, like this is a screening tool for malnutrition, okay? Like th- in order to be sensitive and specific enough and have some reliability data, this is not hard to do compared to telling if someone has a boron deficiency. Yeah. Or, <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I like, mean, the, th- the thing is that people go to these companies and they get these huge testing panels that spits out tons of data, like the inside tracker people, and it has like green lights and red lights, and it looks like so much useful information and gives you... It, it makes you feel like you have some of these, so many targets to optimize your health and stuff like that, but it doesn't come along with information giving you the, the, the performance statistics of the test. It says, you know, oh, you're deficient in this, but the test is pretty terrible. And is it really, we're not really sure if you are or not. You know? Right. Right. So yeah, like, uh, I, I mean, I've interpreted a bunch of those tests and people will say, oh, well, they said my hemoglobin is only in the good range, not the optimal range for an sure. athlete. I'm like, yeah, please supply the data for where, you know, these certain cutoffs, which again are man-made, right? Yeah. And, and in this case, they are made by people who are not scientists. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> where do they correlate reliably to performance? Performance is a multifaceted sort of thing, uh, you know, that has, yes, biological components, yes, psychological, yes, social inputs. And so, you know, trying to boil down somebody's, you know, performance and in, 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 in exercise and training uh, and on the field to to one biological variable or which is in even the normal a, range which is in the normal range <laughs> mind you yeah, yeah yeah so so i as my take on nutrition screening is 
that, again, unless you have a specific disease and where one of the known side effects is that you can develop a nutrition a nutrient deficiency. So for instance, your post uh, gastric bypass or, or, uh, or something like that. Um, you do, you don't need to be screened even for vitamin D, even for vitamin D. Like you don't need to be screened for vitamin D just like you don't need to be screened for low, th- you know, hypothyroidism. Like if you have specific clinical signs and symptoms that increase the clinical suspicion of vitamin D deficiency, then sure. You know, and, and here's, here's the thing uh, maybe the final word I want to say on this nutri- nutrient uh, thing. If you don't have clinical signs and symptoms of the the deficiency, then how would testing and you know maybe supplementing make it any better? Like if outside you have of, no existing outside of, outside of the psychological harm of seeing the low number and then the psychological benefit of taking something to make your psychological harm better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So effectively, you've noceboed yourself, you know, and then. And then you're pushing yourself it. back out of it. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> okay. So I think I've said enough on nutrition. I just, I cannot stress this enough. Like you don't need to be screened unless again, you're hospitalized or in acute care setting. In which case, the, the reason why the screening tests are there is to uh, combat uh, malnutrition that occurs in these settings at a fairly high rate and to identify people who already have malnutrition who are coming into these settings. But again, if you have no clinical uh, symptoms or, or, or other disease processes, like this isn't for you. Don't go get all these tests done. What are you going to do with them anyway? Okay. Moving on exercise. Uh, okay. So right now there are two major screening tools that are used in, um, practice. One is the physical readiness questionnaire, also known as the PAR Q. Uh, the ACSM came up with this uh, like 20 something years ago. Um, that's filled out by the individual. It's basically a series of questions that you answer uh, that should all be no. <laughs> if there's a positive response, then you move to the next level of screening, which is the physical activity readiness medical evaluation, which is supposed to be filled out by a physician with you. It's called huh. the PAR Med Med X, okay. which uh, sounds awesome. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm just gonna go in and check out my PAR Med X <laughs> <laughs> with my doctor. That, and actually, yeah. So I'm not sure how many doctors, clinicians, or like other healthcare professionals actually know about this, but there's a PAR Med X for a lot of different conditions. For so, for instance, cardiovascular disease, a specific one exists. Pregnancy is specific one exists by the Canadian Exercise Council. They the people who came up with their latest recommendations, um, and so there's a handful of different ones that are available based on the actual uh, disease process that you're trying to assess risk of. And so I, I think that this, you know, we should discuss like well, why are these screening tools even there, right? Like what why are why are we doing this? So the idea is that there's some non-zero risk of a single bout of exercise. Some, uh, an, uh, there's a non-zero risk of badness, like a, a cardio, cardiovascular event or otherwise unwanted event from a single bout of exercise. Whereas most, if not all of the data on long-term chronic exposure to exercise is positive. So we're not worried about the chronic long-term effects of exercise. Cause again, those are generally positive. We're worried about, is there a risk of a person having a bad outcome from this single bout of exercise when they're not used to it, when they haven't exercised before. And so in the case of cardiovascular disease, so the, the incidence of this happening if for guys is one sudden death per 1.51 million episodes of exertion. Uh, whereas for women, it's one per 36 and a half million wow. <laughs> episodes of exercise. <laughs> the women are killing it yeah. compared to compared to guys on this one. Um, you know, it, it, the counter argument to this is like, all right, if 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 we know that there's some risk and that potentially some populations need to be assessed or undergo a further you know, level of assessment prior to initiating exercise, does this actually like stunt participation? You know, does this like prevent people from engaging in exercise when they other, you know, otherwise would. And overwhelmingly the data suggests no. So basic, so, so for instance, like in cardiac rehab, uh, uh, patients, so cardiac rehab after like a heart attack or stent placement or both, uh, depending on, you know, why somebody got, got there it usually only lasts six months. And the people who are not like pushed into cardiac rehab d- do not participate. It's less than half 
in the United States. And 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 it, even all the people who are eligible to participate in cardiac rehab and like have the insurance to pay for it and everything else don't participate. So most of the data suggests that people, when they see their doctor about exercise, specifically for clearance to exercise, um, will in fact exercise more uh, than if they didn't. So I'm actually, yeah. And, and so I think the discussion now becomes like, when would you move to a higher level of screening for uh, or high level of assessment uh, for somebody uh, with respect to exercise? So I, I think it's reasonable that if somebody has a positive finding from their par Q, that initial questionnaire, which I think if you work in a gym, if you're coaching people, like you should be using this, it's free, it's available on the internet. That should be like, you're just your screening test. Like, is can somebody exercise with me today? Like, just use that, have them fill it out. If there's some positive finding where it's like, yo, I have chest pain upon exertion. <laughs> well, that'd be fairly obvious, right? But if you didn't have any screening tool, yeah, if you were sure. like, yeah, just come, come, to my, come to my garage and squat with me, yeah. uh, then I, I think that uh, you should start using this. So if somebody has a positive answer here, then the next thing should be, well, I think before you have unrestricted exercise opportunities, you should see your doctor, have them fill out this par med X. You can church it up a little bit and say, it's the par med X. And then... Um, <laughs> After, after that, I, I think not only have you likely improved the person's compliance rate with exercise in general, just based on the existing data that we have, but it's also just peace of mind, right? Like, like yes, these events are relatively rare, but they're not zero. Yeah. Can you, I mean, and I'll point out that uh, this is following the same screening and confirmatory sequence that we talked about earlier, right? So you're going through step one, you get a positive test on your par Q, for example, it could be a true positive or it could be a false positive. But ideally, mm -hmm. that does that test does not produce a whole bunch of false negatives where you have a bunch of people who are getting chest pain with exercise who, you know, are who don't have a way to make that apparent on the on the test. So you get your true or false positives, you send them to their doctor, the doctor's job is to to figure out is this a true positive or a false positive um, based on further confirmatory kind of evaluation and then they send it back to you and you can train them. Yeah, I actually, and I saw a link the par Q below because I just think that people should be familiar with that. Uh, wh one thing that I, I didn't know that they did this. So, so let's say you get referred to your cardiologist for this par med X. One of the recommended treatments or like recommended um, uh, testing like further assessments rather is to do an exercise stress test. Like, so they're not just like kind of weighing the positives and negatives and like saying, ah, yeah, you could exercise. They're saying, huh, I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> so, so actually, and so two like really large trials have looked at this each with over 40,000 people getting exercise stress tests after failing a par Q. Um, uh, what's interesting, yeah, so only five cardiovascular events happened in all 80 plus thousand individuals that got exercise stress tested after failing a par Q. Uh, so those would be the people that you uh, wanted to identify. But I just I, I actually thought that the the adverse event in a cardiac stress test would have been higher in that population who failed yeah. a par Q. But yeah, and this anyway. is a situation that makes you ask, because remember our first criterion was that this needs to be a very prevalent condition in the population. Overall, these data are suggesting it doesn't happen all that often, but they're probably coming from the argument of, well, when it does happen, it's sudden cardiac death, and it's so severe that we yeah. were, well, we're going to be overly aggressive, quote unquote, to, to, to catch it when we can. Um, right. But I assume yeah. that it's after- It's a fatal, fatal error. Yeah, yeah. I, I assume that after you go through your par Q, if it's negative, you proceed to a functional movement screen. Yeah. <sighs> So, yeah, I, this is everyone's like, I, I don't know why we still get questions on this, only because the data to suggest that the functional movement screen is not good at doing anything is so robust and is old now. Like, it, it's like creatine data. Like, I, I, don't, I just don't, like, like when people ask me about creatine, I'm like, really? This is your question? Where have you like, been? You know, <laughs> yeah, where have you been? Uh, so the functional movement screen um, was originally, you know, designed to I basically identify muscular imbalances, range of motion issues, uh, movement disorders that would either portend a negative, uh, like out, uh, a negative outcome, like injury or reduce performance, or ultimately identify and ultimately identify places where people should stretch more or strengthen and stuff like that. Uh, so you, again, following the criteria, you would have to su suspect that there is a hugely prevalent problem, uh, with 
movement disorders. These are and, and, and muscular and, imbalances. Yeah, and and to be clear, these are not real movement disorders because a real movement disorder is like Parkinson's or something sure, like just that. Don't, yeah. These are just made up movement disorders like ankle mobility. <laughs> yeah, which is fine to like make up an arbitrary or man made you know movement disorder if in fact it does correlate with like Harm. general bat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, so not only are these movement disorders like not prevalent when tested, like, you know, you're going to, depending on the population you look at, you can find, uh, you know, failure rates of the test as high as, you know, 15, 60% in athletic population to as low as 10%, just depends who you look at and, you know, the, the, the specific specifics of the cohort, but they don't identify or, 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 or correlate well with injuries in sport like they, they just don't in any in a in a specific or sensitive manner it, it's li- literally less than a coin flip so it's like why are you doing it yeah i mean if you get paid to do it it'd be very difficult to like then reverse your stance on this because then you'd have to both admit that you've been doing wrong for a long period of time and you lose a source of revenue but your functional movement screen is not uh recommended by anybody outside of NASM who happened to like, you know, come up with the thing. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's telling that despite this being out for such a long time that none of the other fitness organizations who could either make their own proprietary functional movement type screen or endorse a functional movement screen, uh, none of them have said that this is a good idea. And in the other thing is if this was so good at doing anything, you would expect like the, the physical activity guidelines for Americans to yeah. incorporate, you know, something on screening if, uh, on, on using this functional movement screen. Yeah. It turns out the last thing we should be doing is erecting more barriers to exercise. And so I, I would say for the audience listening, if you ever see something or hear something or read something, you know, whether it be social media or wherever you're looking, if you see something that says stop or you need to do this before you blank squat deadlift run swim whatever then apply our screening criteria to it to try to figure out if that's something that's worth doing is it identifying a major problem is it identifying something you know that has a good does it is there actually a good test for this and if you find something is there something you can do about it that will reduce harm is it something that would have caused harm anyway or would you have just been able to go about go about continuing to live your life and train and be completely normal um if that's the case then you can safely ignore the person and move on which is a safe assumption for just about all of these things because we've talked about really the only situation where pre-exercise screening is necessary and it has to do with like you know these actual health conditions that put you at risk of dying or something like that uh screening with respect to injury risk does not work probably will never work i think there's a title in the bjsm of that very title where it says like why screening for injury uh doesn't and will never work something to that effect uh discussing this phenomenon and so you know it's generally safe to move around (laughs) (laughs) right right uh yeah so so i think yes for most of the exercise uh, related questions that the only things we should be doing from a screening perspective are the PAR-Q. And if uh, that identifies somebody who may be at increased risk, then you do the PAR-Med-X. Um, and there are specific PAR-Med-Xs for different conditions, including pregnancy, cardiovascular disease, etc. Uh, there's also a cancer one, which is interesting. Although, yeah, in some of these cases, there's less data to actually support their utility. So, for instance, the pregnancy one, there's no data sure. to suggest that the parmedics, <laughs> you know, yeah. is helpful. There's no, and then same thing for the cancer for the cancer parmedics. But I, again, I think it's it's more of a useful assessment for the clinician when they're trying to actually maybe challenge some of their own biases, yeah. right? So, like if a cardiologist was like, "Oh, you've, you know, why are you here? You're asking if you if you can exercise, like, because you failed this par Q." Then they actually have to think about it, yeah. right? And then this gives this gives it some this gives them some um, uh, rationale to actually go about making this cost benefit. Sure. Assessment. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. So, all right. Recommendations for screening. Uh, what do you? What do you? What's your like parting thoughts on this sort of deal? Yeah. 
my parting thoughts are that we should follow the evidence base to screen for things that we have good evidence that we should be screening for. In other words, things that sure. uh, are prevalent enough that have a latent phase where we have a good test to find something and a treatment we can we can apply to significantly improve people's outcomes while you know not outweighing not being outweighed by harms or risks to the screening. Uh, with respect to biomedicine uh, world. I think that, you know, the evidence based on screening should probably shift more in a direction towards looking at effects on all cause mortality um, versus, you know, exclusively looking at disease specific mortality, because we have plenty of evidence showing that one does not al always translate into the other. And that can be explained partially, at least um, by some of the harms of screening that are generally under recognized by people. And so I think that, you know, we need to be uh, I think that this focus on the evidence and and focus on this sort of thing is going to end up shifting us more and more in a direction of more targeted screening tests versus just massive, just everybody should be doing this particular thing. There are only a small handful of things that we can say we should do that for, for people who, for if you want to know what those things are or what applies to you. Again, we provided some resources with the EPSS tool the uh, and the UCSF tool. And this is, again, not to make you take this information and say, OK, I'm going to do this or not, but rather that you take this information and use it as part of a better kind of shared decision making process, either with your patients or if you're a healthcare provider or with your doctor, if you're a patient. Yep, I agree. All right. That's been it for the Barbell Medicine podcast here on screening. Make sure you head over to iTunes and leave us a five star rating and review. It really helps us out. And we'll catch you guys next time. See you. Medicine is a vertical integration of modern medicine and strength conditioning. We want to bring strength conditioning to the medical field and we want to bring modern medicine to the strength conditioning field. We have three different types of product offerings right now from a supplement standpoint. Whey protein, peri workout, and then the final newest offering that we have is a vegan protein. actually one of Barbell Medicine's first online clients and through that coaching process went from just having had rotator cuff surgery to then becoming a competitive power lifter in the process. People come to us from all walks of life with all sorts of background experiences with all sorts of problems. It ends up being a collaboration between client and coach to optimize their long-term kind of health and performance outcomes. On our team, we have a great group of folks. We have myself, Austin Baraki, Leah Lutz, Joe Pemberton's out in Australia, Alan Thrall, Tom Campitelli, Hassan, Alex, Michael Ray, Derek Miles, Jess Griffith, Vanessa Berman. It's just a great group of people with a wide variety of different backgrounds, and we're all working together to help you achieve your goals. Yeah.